the uh, title of the of the talk, um, but I didn't want to put it up immediately because I'm I'm calling this presentation the Golden Age of Produce, and I didn't want to just have that up there and have everybody say like. Well, what is this guy, like a hired gun or a shill for the produce industry? Um, I can tell you, I, uh, I am not actually a member of the produce industry. I'm, I'm a member of, uh, of the food service industry overall. And so I track trends uh, throughout the segments, uh, both commercial and non-commercial, uh, identifying opportunities with ingredients all over the place. But I can tell you today, uh, truly, that um, I believe that we are on the leading edge and entering uh, what I would say is the golden age of produce in food service, and uh, so through my talk, uh, I, I, hopefully it's going to become evident uh, what sort of opportunities are uh, uh, emerging for the food service industry, uh, I'm sorry, for the produce industry from, from the uh, food service side. So I don't want to take up a bunch of time, and I am not going to, I'm not going to run over here, famous last words. Uh, but I'm not going to take a bunch of time talking about our MO, because I could probably take 10 minutes talking about how we go through the whole process. But just in short, uh, the bottom line with the uh, research that we do with Culinary R&D at Gordon Food Service, uh, what we feel is truly the unique differentiator is the external re research that we do. And in short, uh, we follow what is happening uh, with new restaurant openings in the three major trend-driving cities of, in order, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. And uh, we literally pour over hundreds of websites of new restaurants. Why new restaurants? Uh, because we feel that those are the ones that have to be doing something unique. You can't do the same old thing over and over and expect to be successful. Uh, and so that's why we look at new restaurants. Why uh, Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles? Simple answer, limited time and treasure. Uh, there are a lot of other roles that I serve at Gordon Food Service, but uh, uh, so what we do is we, in a very time and uh, treasure uh, efficient manner go about uh, doing our research, but throughout the year we pour over hundreds of websites of these new restaurants uh, and then we uh, basically winnow those lists down to about 40 to 45 restaurants per city uh, and then once we have these very carefully targeted lists put together we go to those cities, we uh, eat our way through the menus at these targeted restaurants, we completely document everything that we see and taste and then talk to anyone and everyone within the restaurant that will talk to us about their establishment, uh, what their uh, personal cooking philosophy is and uh, their view of the industry and what is happening in their particular town. So um, in the uh, early part of 2015 was when we did our first external research um, and at that time between the three cities we visited 108 restaurants and uh, tasted 1151 dishes. Uh, I'm telling you folks, you don't want to taste 1151 dishes in five weeks, I, I promise you, but it's really uh, the only way that you can really get um, a, a street level real world view of what is happening with the evolution of foods and flavors in restaurants is to get into the restaurants and actually get uh, the food into your mouths. It's not something that you can do sitting in front of a computer. Well, uh, we decided that we were going to change our scheduling just a little bit, and so for the past decade, we have been doing our research in, in January and February. We decided now we were going to move it up and do it in November and December, and so we actually, just in the past month, have completed our most recent, what we're calling our 2016 research, uh, in Chicago and uh, New York. So our most recent research... Um, let me, oh, I'm sorry, um, that last build there, um, I, I also want to point out that um, the research that we do in the three cities, we actually execute in 15 working days. So once again, we do not have any moss growing under our feet uh, when we're doing this type of research. But uh, over the past month, as we have visited uh, New York and Chicago, uh, we have already visited 81 restaurants and um, uh, tasted 876 dishes. And um, the great news is, is that this is where we're premiering uh, the new uh, insights uh, regarding produce from these uh, first two cities. And and of the 70 slides that I have in this presentation, about 50 are uh, brand new uh, plate presentations, uh, uh, v uh, vegetable and fruit centric uh, plate presentations from our most recent uh, research. So. Once again, I said Jim really teed it up very well for me uh, with, with his opening comments, but truly uh, the inspiration for this presentation as uh, over the past couple of years I've really become much more interested in what is happening with, with produce in food service. Um, I was uh, at a conference in mid-summer and there was a, uh, a, a pretty, I mean a high level member of the, the produce industry that got up and did a presentation and I, I don't mean to be negative but I was really kind of surprised because uh, of course he was talking about about, um, you know, how can we get people to eat more uh, produce in, in food service, but 
the, the underlying feeling and message that I kind of got, the, the, this person was almost apologetic uh, and, and kind of referring to produce as being like second banana to, uh, you know, meats and proteins on uh, menus in restaurants. And I don't know. Once again, I'm not a member of the, uh, the, the direct produce community, and maybe he felt beat up because... Uh, you know, I mean, meats and fish and poultry and everything, I mean, that's always been the center of menus. Uh, but once again, I truly feel that we are entering a golden age of produce, and um, I, I think that any desire to apologize or consider produce to be second banana on the menu is going to get wiped out here um, in the next decade. And what I am referring to is um, what we call vegetable-centric cooking. And... Um, what we are seeing in the industry, and we have certainly seen this emerge over the past couple of years, are uh, in food service, in new restaurants, we're seeing chefs and operators become increasingly creative uh, with the use of uh, uh, produce on their menus to the point where it truly has become um, a new mindset. And the change that we are seeing, this sea change, is that um, chefs are now treating produce with the same high regard that they formerly only held for, uh, you know, meats and fish and poultry uh, and things like this. And so, you know, okay, they're, they're, they're holding them in the same regard. What does that mean? Uh, well, first, they're, they're applying the same level of uh, passion and skill um, uh, and creativity to these dishes, um, you know, using uh, uh, aggressive cooking methods that are uh, uh, producing dishes that have tremendous flavor layering. But one thing that I want to emphasize um, is that this vegetable-centric cuisine is very different than uh, vegetarian or vegan dining. Um, and we really need to draw that distinction, and I, and I want to make sure that everybody understands what we're talking about, because this is the thing that's, that's going to drive this golden age of produce in the, uh, in the, in the coming uh, decade. Um, and, and once again, there's nothing the matter with vegetarian cuisine uh, or vegan dining, but what we know from 30 years of NPD statistics is that, uh, in general, uh, at any given time, only 2 or 3% of the population is eating vegetarian or vegan at any given time. Now, uh, depending on what food service segment you are in, vegetarian and vegan cu uh, cuisine can be uh, a, a great sales building opportunity. If you're in college and university, it, it almost becomes a no-brainer because, you know, much more of those people are, are experimenting with that type of dining. Um, and if you do it right and you open uh, just a, a wonderful vegetarian or vegan restaurant in commercial food service, there is an opportunity. But we know that for mainstream, casual, casual, upscale, even mid-scale restaurants, that vegetarian dining is really not a huge sales building opportunity, as opposed to vegetable-centric, which is really aimed at the other 97% of the dining community. Omnivorous dining consumers that would eat more vegetable and fruit-based dishes if only they tasted better. And that is the difference that we're seeing today. And one of the, and one of the things that really draws that distinction is that, um, as Jim was talking about, I mean, you know, the rest of the world traditionally has um, uh, uh, used meats and fish and poultry. I was talking with Chef Souvere the other day, and I used the term protein. He says, no, no, vegetables have a lot of protein in them. It's the meats and the fish and the poultry that are used as a garnish on the dishes, as a flavor enhancement where the, the, the vegetables, the produce is, is uh, at the center of the plate. That's the same sort of thing that we're seeing, but in much different directions with vegetable-centric cuisine. Um, so once again, these protein elements may be uh, a little crumble of sausage. It may be a few anchovies draped on a plate. Um, it could be some very flavorful southern country ham. Uh, that is used as a flavoring in the dish. Um, but one other thing that we are seeing, and this is a, a, a growing trend, are chefs that are actually taking vegetables and uh, pre-cooking them in some sort of a meat-based broth. And you can imagine what that does uh, to kick up the flavor of the vegetables. So once again, when we talk about vegetarian, or I'm sorry, uh, vegetable-centric cuisine, we are really not referring to vegetarian or vegan. Uh, they are really two totally different animals. Um, so now I'd like to take you through uh, some restaurants and um, uh, some plate presentations, but I have to start, <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> I have to start with the gentleman that you see on the screen here, Travis Lutt. He actually, as far as chefs are concerned, is my personal hero today, <clears throat> and I really consider him to be the, uh, the father of vegetable-centric cuisine on modern menus. Seven years ago, he opened up a wonderful restaurant in Venice, California called Jolina. 
And uh, once again, with the MO, the way that we do our research, we looked at Jelena's menu online, we read about the restaurant, we said, hey, well, this is, this is a no-brainer, we definitely want to go and visit the restaurant. But it really wasn't until we sat down and the waitress handed us the menu uh, that we really uh, were kind of knocked out of our uh, seats with what we saw because, I mean, absolutely dead center. Uh, in the middle of the menu was this offering of uh, vegetable dishes. Now, when Jelena opened, uh, it, it, the, all of the dishes were uh, $8. Today, they're $9. But here, and what you're seeing here is uh, one of last year's lunch menus. And all of these um, uh, dishes that, that, once again, I mean, you can see with all of the various ingredients, the cooking methods that are being used, uh, the protein additions, these, this is very, very different than the typical side dishes that are relegated to the bottom of a menu. Uh, now, I'd also like to point out, once again, trying to be good stewards of time and treasure uh, for Gordon Food Service, we generally have a rule that, we, that if we uh, visit a restaurant during our research, we go there once and, uh, and that's it. We, we go on to other things. But um, the menu at Jelena, the flavor of the vegetable dishes has so drawn me in uh, that not only have we visited the restaurant every two years to watch how the menu has been uh, uh, evolving, but anytime we've had a key customer in the Los Angeles area, we've either taken them uh, ourselves or said, please make sure that you make the trip over to Venice um, <clears throat> and visit, uh, visit Jelena. So here are just a few examples of um, uh, some of the most recent dishes that Chef Lett um, has been doing on his menu. This is a, a charred Romanesco. Um, in the kitchen at Jelena, they have just stacks of rolled steel pans, which get very smoking hot really quickly. Uh, and so for this dish, they're uh, taking the Romanesco, hitting it in a, a smoking hot pan, uh, and then bathing the Romanesco uh, with a fairly traditional Latin sofrito sauce. However, uh, there is a fair amount of uh, chopped anchovy that has been added to this to make the dis dish taste fantastic. Fishy? Absolutely not. It's a kick up that umami, kick up the complexity of the flavor. Top it with a little bit of chopped herbs and some uh, uh, red Fresno chilies. Uh, absolutely beautiful. Uh, this is one of the few vegetable dishes that has been on the menu with Jelena since day one, uh, which they call grilled radicchio. Just for the record, uh, in this particular dish, he was uh, using treviso, the kind of uh, 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 radicchio uh, hybrid, but you can see the aggressive cooking, uh, taking that treviso and putting it on the char grill and getting it nice and smoky, and then brushing it as it's cooking with a bagnacotta, that, that classic Italian, uh, it's actually a vegetable dip with olive oil and garlic uh, and anchovy. So once again, this is not a meatless dish, this is being brushed with a, a, an anchovy dip uh, that once again gives that umami and gives the depth uh, to the dish. Um, here are some very simple roasted peppers uh, that are garnished with some cured uh, Castro Vetrano olives and then once again draped with some fresh anchovies to uh, provide that protein element. Uh, and then a very delicious dish of uh, grilled summer squash with botarga, uh, a cherry tomato confit, and za'atar. But once again, we have the botarga in there, uh, just a, a little bit of seafood to provide that uh, umami, uh, but not a meatless dish. So that was seven years ago, and we've been visiting him for uh, the uh, uh, visiting Chef Lett for the past few years. And really, this whole kind of uh, technique uh, that Chef Lett had been using on his vegetables were really owned by him at Jelena. Uh, but last year, I mean, really in 2014, when we started looking at the new restaurants for our 2015 research, we started to see chefs that were adopting this same technique and uh, one of the preeminent examples is Chalk Point Kitchen uh, which opened now about uh, 18 months ago um, in the Soho neighborhood uh, here in New York. A wonderful chef, Michelin star chef uh, Joel Isidori um, and take a look at the menu that he has put together at Chalk Point. Once again smack dab in the middle of the menu, uh, vegetables to share, very very Jelena like. Uh, when we went into Chalk Point Kitchen, Chef Isidori who's so turned on because I was talking about you know let's really look at all of this vegetable centric and uh, he was extremely gracious so I never got to the point where I asked him where he got the inspiration for the menu. I I'm fairly convinced that he saw what Chef Light was doing uh, uh, you know, in a very unique way at Jelena uh, but once again he did not just blatantly rip off the idea. He brought that back to Chalk Point Kitchen. He has a totally different cooking style, uh, but once again, one thing he has in common with Chef Lett uh, is, is uh, really creating complex, highly flavored, boldly flavored dishes that in no way resemble um, a side dish. Um, and here's just a few examples. Um, this is a tempura battered and fried uh, sweet potato. 
uh, and this is served in a, um, a, a bowl in a pool of a uh, house-made ponzu sauce, uh, and then it's drizzled with a uh, yuzu kosho, uh, a nice fermented um, uh, citrus uh, marinade, uh, and then topped once again, not a meatless dish because you can't really see it in the picture, but it's topped with a nice handful of katsubushi, the uh, shaved bonito flakes, uh, which gives it that umami kick. Um, how is that for a plate of uh, succotash? Uh, normally succotash is what, corn and lima beans, and you know, here we have roasted carrots and mushrooms, um, uh, a, a little bit of escarole, and all of these vegetables are taken and just hit in a smoking hot pan uh, to provide caramelization and then topped with a, a lovely creamy uh, citrus vinaigrette. Um, this is vegetarian by no means. This is uh, um, Chef Isidori's uh, sautéed Russian kale. It's about 50% house-made chorizo, and then it's topped with crispy shallots. Absolutely dynamite. Uh, and then, um, of course, the Japanese tonkatsu generally is some sort of a breaded and fried chicken or pork cutlet. Uh, in the case of Chalk Point Kitchen, uh, Chef Isidori is using a piece of eggplant uh, to create an eggplant tonkatsu served in a, a, a very nice uh, chili and soy-based broth with uh, just nice fresh vegetables, uh, uh, some diced avocado and sliced radish, uh, but then also uh, just a little bit of um, pickled red uh, onion to uh, provide just a little bit of a counterpoint, kind of an acid counterpoint to the richness in that um, fried tonkatsu. Uh, then we have another restaurant uh, uh, here in New York in the West Village uh, called Via Carota, uh, which opened uh, just about a year ago, uh, last December. Uh, Chefs Rita Sodi and Jody Williams, uh, just a wonderful, what they call an Italian gastroteca. But once again, in the middle of their menu, they have this offering of what they're calling, it's an Italian restaurant, so they're calling it Verjure, uh, 15 different vegetable items, very, very complex, uh, wonderful dishes that once again in no way resemble a side dish. Um, here are a few examples. I had earlier talked about um, uh, how chefs uh, were taking uh, fresh produce and cooking them in some sort of a meat broth. This is a great example. Uh, this is their finocchi or uh, fennel bulb, which they are poaching um, in a veal stock and then serving room temperature uh, topped with a, just a very nice uh, relish of uh, colored bell peppers, a little bit of fennel frond, uh, and then bathing this in a uh, vinaigrette flavored with uh, both cara cara and blood orange. Uh, absolutely delicious. Um, here is some uh, pan-roasted salsi fee, uh, done fairly simply, roasted with some brown butter, topped with a little bit of fresh thyme. Uh, but once again, uh, this is a sharing plate. This is not a side dish by any means, much too boldly flavored. Uh, likewise, with uh, uh, their roasted celery root, uh, you can see the aggressive cooking uh, that uh, Chef Sodi and Williams are using as they oven roast this uh, celery root uh, and then plate it with a very nice, uh, kind of a traditional style uh, Italian gremolata. Uh, cabbage. Most of the time, even when I think of cabbage, I mean, it strikes me as a fairly one of the more bland vegetables. Uh, but once again, even something like cabbage can be taken and turned into something extraordinary. Uh, here they're just taking a quarter uh, cabbage wedge uh, and they're uh, char grilling this, uh, brushing it with um, uh, an Italian agrodolce. Uh, a sweet and sour uh, condiment. They're brushing that on as it grills uh, and then finishing that with some toasted pine nuts and um, uh, dried currants. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, so those are uh, the restaurants that we actually have been talking about over the past year. Uh, but as I said, the majority of this presentation are brand new slides from brand new restaurants from the research we've done over the last month. And so uh, this next restaurant is a new entry into the uh, uh, veg-centric category uh, that uh, we were absolutely thrilled to find and just love the cuisine. Um, and that is Untitled, uh, which is the restaurant in the uh, Whitney Museum. Um, and is uh, helmed by executive chef Michael Anthony. This is uh, one of um, Danny Meyer's restaurants. Uh, chef Michael Anthony is also the executive chef at the uh, celebrated Gramercy Tavern. Now, one thing about the veg-centric uh, menu at Untitled, rather than having um, a section of vegetable dishes, the veg-centric offerings are woven through all of the different courses. Uh, but once again, these are, these are not vegetarian items. Uh, these are veg-centric at their heart, and they have the same sort of uh, complex uh, flavor layering um, and uh, bold flavors via the aggressive cooking techniques uh, that Chef Anthony um, uh, has on the menu. The picture there, just uh, as an aside, uh, Chef Anthony was there, and I mean, you know, this is a James Beard award-winning 
very, very high on the pyramid chef, and he walked up to our table, he saw us taking pictures and everything, he's like, hey, I'm Chef Mike. And I'm like, holy smoke, is it Michael Anthony? And so he was nice enough to take a picture with us and uh, spend some time with us, just an absolutely wonderful, uh, gracious uh, chef. Uh, so here are some of the dishes that he's offering on his uh, menu currently. Um, here's an apple and uh, celery root salad uh, that is garnished with puffed white rice, but once again, not vegetarian, uh, small bits of smoked Arctic char are uh, tossed through the dish. Um, here's a wonderful roasted uh, cauliflower that he serves with a, a cardamom custard uh, and uh, candied lemon. Uh, roasted potatoes. Here he's taking butterball potatoes and he's uh, uh, oven roasting them, peeling them, and slicing them, uh, and then laying those out on the plate and then finishing the dish with uh, uh, dollops of whipped buttermilk, uh, fried, uh, crispy fried capers, and little dollops of trout roe. Uh, once again, those very small protein elements um, are what makes the difference in these dishes. Uh, and then likewise, um, uh, this is a dish of salsi fee and carrots, uh, very nicely oven roasted, but you'll also see on the plate some uh, small lardon of uh, roasted guanciale, the, uh, uh, the pork jowl, uh, and then uh, drizzled with a honey mustard. So um, that's the latest veg-centric uh, restaurant that, that we have discovered where a chef is really going full bore and um, uh, you know creating that next wave of uh, produce that we believe is going to move this golden age of produce along. Uh, but for everyone in the industry, and, and I found this really interesting because this was just pure serendipity, uh, two books have come out in the past five weeks that I consider to be absolute must-reads uh, for anyone in the produce industry. And just coincidentally, the first one is Travis Lett's book from Jelena, and the second one is V for Vegetables by Michael Anthony. So, uh, you know, you talk about serendipity and coincidences and things. I couldn't believe it, but actually both of these volumes uh, were issued on the same day, October 27th. So once again, these are absolutely hot off the press. Um, I have had the joy of reading through both of them, and uh, I have really learned a ton about what these chefs are doing uh, to, uh, to, to promote uh, vegetable centricity um, on their menus. So if I could, I'd like to just uh, very quickly read a couple of quotes uh, from these books. Uh, the first, uh, Travis Lett, once again, I see he's my, my personal hero. That is my favorite picture of Chef Lett at his new restaurant, Justa. Uh, and here he is uh, scaling and rolling baguette um, at 3 a.m. Uh, once again, my uh, personal hero. And here's what he has to say in the book. When Jelena was in the construction phase, people would often ask me what the concept was for the new restaurant. And I would reply, uh, reply somewhat sheepishly, that I wanted to focus primarily on small seasonal vegetable dishes. And more often than not, uh, the people would look at me with uh, kind of a, well, good luck with that type of expression, and they'd walk off. And admittedly, paying top dollar Los Angeles rents and selling $8 vegetable plates did seem a little off. But the reality is that our vegetable dishes attract people and serve as the center centerpiece of the Jolina dining experience. And as I said, I mean, from a personal standpoint, the, the menu, this vegetable-centric offering, has been drawing me to Jolina for years. But I go on. Listing the daily selection of vegetables in the dead center of the menu is our way of directing the diner's attention toward these dishes. And our focus on vegetables has made us a twice a week or more kind of establishment for many folks in our neighborhood, rather than a place that you only go occasionally for the celebratory steak or fish. And then once again, I talked about the, the, the aggressive cooking techniques that are used that are really the hallmark of vegetable-centric cooking. At Jelena, rather than steaming or boiling vegetables, we sear them and then add small amounts of liquid to briefly simmer and meld the flavors, or quickly blanch them before uh, slapping them on the grill or in a searing hot pan. And then, to add layers of flavor to our vegetable dishes, we draw from an arsenal of pestos, pistos, gremoladas, aiolis, harissas, and other little sauces and emulsions that are generally easy to make, hold up well at room temperature, and can be made in advance and applied effortlessly. That, to me, is truly a change in mindset of the way that, that uh, fruits and vegetables are prepared on commercial menus. So then let's go to V for Vegetables with uh, Chef Michael Anthony. And here was the quote from his introduction. This book is emphatically not a call to vegetarianism. I do not cook that way, I do not eat that way, and I don't want to suggest that you should. 
What's really important to me is this new and exciting way of eating that puts vegetables in the spotlight and consciously reconsiders the role that proteins play. I don't want to give up fish or meat. To have a healthy farm, you need a healthy cycle of elements, and that includes livestock. It is only in meat-centric America that we think loving vegetables inevitably means hating meat. But I like eating well, I like living well, and I do not believe in a cuisine of exclusion or deprivation. I believe in finding a better balance. For me, cooking with vegetables is not a political act, it's an enlightened way of thinking. So once again, I really consider these to be game-changing chefs that are really changing the face of what is happening with fresh produce on menus. Uh, and as we can clearly see, we're talking beyond vegetarian. Um, and, and, and the great thing about that is, once again, the broader appeal. Vegetable-centric truly is aimed at that 97% uh, the omnivorous dining consumers that are, that are looking for uh, better tasting vegetable dishes on menus. And as Chef Lett pointed out, this truly can lead to increased dining frequency. So uh, it's about a better balance, but make no mistake, um, if people are going to be uh, eating more produce-based dishes on menus, it always, as anything, uh, it, particularly in commercial, commercial food service, it boils down to flavor, flavor, flavor. Uh, and that is what these chefs are doing in a, a wonderfully uh, trailblazing fashion. So uh, now let's go on and um, let's look at some other aspects of uh, vegetable-centric cuisine uh, that we're seeing in lesser degrees on menus. Uh, when we went out for our 2015 research in January and February of uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, we actually identified uh, 16 more restaurants that were doing vegetable-centric dishes, uh, but really we're not jumping in with both feet like uh, Chef Ladd or Chef Williams and Sodi uh, are doing, but once again using those vegetable-centric principles uh, um, to create superior dishes. So uh, we've got a few different categories that I want to cover here. And the first one is, uh, of course, uh, we've been talking a lot about vegetables. But um, as Jim said in his intro, and as we're uh, uh, saying, it is not just vegetables, but it's also fruit. Uh, so let's take a look at some of those really dynamite fruit-based dishes that we're seeing. Uh, here's a great example from uh, Chef Let's uh, Jelena menu. These are his uh, uh, grilled summer nectarines. Uh, this is garnished with just a little bit of burrata, the uh, uh, fresh mozzarella pouch. Uh, some baby arugula, uh, a very nice agrodolce. I had talked about the agrodolce that Williams and Sodi had put on that cabbage. Um, here, Chef Lett uh, took Zinfandel wine and vinegar and sugar, reduced it down into this beautiful uh, Zinfandel agrodolce, uh, drizzled that on the plate. And then once again, for that umami kick, it's topped with uh, some thin, very thin shavings of a, uh, a Benton's country ham. Uh, when I was showing that veal po stock poached um, fennel bulb at Via Carota, uh, I had mentioned that the vinaigrette was made with uh, cara cara and uh, blood oranges. Well, actually, uh, there is another dish on the menu, and cross-utilization is very important. Uh, this is a beautiful dish of sliced uh, cara cara and uh, blood oranges. Uh, then Williams and Sodi were taking the, the peels and actually squeezing the balance of the juice out to make that vinaigrette for the finocchi. But here, once again, this is a savory uh, fruit dish uh, that is topped with pickled red onions and uh, fresh basil uh, and then finished with a uh, vinaigrette based on the Italian sparkling wine Prosecco. So once again, a very wonderful uh, Prosecco vinaigrette um, on that plate. A uh, brand new restaurant in, uh, <coughs> pardon me, in uh, New York here, La, La Pecora Bianca. Uh, this is their charred Bartlett pears. This was an astoundingly delicious dish, uh, garnished with smoked ricotta cheese. Seeing a lot of interesting things happening with um, smoked dairy products on menus uh, beyond your regular smoked cheeses, uh, and this was one of them. Uh, and then also garnished with uh, some toasted hazelnuts and uh, candied lemon. Um, you know, and I put this in my notes at the beginning, and I forgot to point this out, so I guess I will say it now. One of the other things about these vegetable-centric dishes uh, is the fact that you can't make meat look as beautiful as something like what you're seeing on, on the screen right here. I mean, you can take some very nice garnishes and put it on top of a piece of meat uh, to make it more attractive, but when fruit and vegetables uh, are at the heart of the dish, uh, I mean, you can just create such unbelievably attractive and beautiful uh, plate presentations. Uh, this is actually just a, a breakfast toast um, at a, uh, a butcher shop and a restaurant in Chicago, Public and Quality Meats. Uh, and so this is their breakfast apple toast that's served on some toasted multigrain bread uh, spread with some fromage blanc, a little bit of uh, shredded Belgian endive, uh, and toasted walnuts. But once again, I, I mean, in my opinion, uh, that is just an absolutely drop-dead gorgeous uh, uh, fruit-based dish. 
Um, here's another one, Tilda All Day. This is a brand new restaurant in, uh, in Brooklyn. And if you happen to be in Will Williamsburg in Brooklyn, I would highly recommend going to Tilda because it's, it looks like a little hole in the wall. Uh, they do breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but the dishes that the chef was putting out, I, I was just absolutely astounded. So uh, this is yet another toast, an all-day toast, um, uh, that is uh, garnished with slices of persimmon and then topped with just a little bit of uh, toasted lardo. Once again, that little bit of lardo, a little bit of that pork fat that is drizzled on there, provides that, uh, uh, that umami that, that helps that dish uh, transcend something that is just uh, a, a plain vegetable or fruit. Uh, here's, an, here's another example. I mean, to me, this is just such a drop-dead gorgeous plate presentation. This is from uh, uh, Pez Cantina, a new Mexican restaurant in Los Angeles, where uh, Chef Jose Estrada uh, is doing this watermelon torta. And the chef was nice enough to actually take us back in the kitchen, because I was so astounded by this dish. Uh, and what they do is actually, they take watermelon, just regular-sized watermelon, and they slice it on the slicer. Uh, so it's maybe, I don't know, three-eighths of an inch thick. They cut the rind off, and then they build what actually looks like a watermelon wedding cake or burger birthday cake uh, with layers of queso fresco and, and thin slices of avocado and jicama and cucumber. Uh, and then when they get an order in the kitchen, they just cut off little angular pieces and arrange it on the plate, uh, garnish it with a little bit of rye cracker in the middle, and then they drizzle it with an avocado and jalapeno emulsion, little drizzle of uh, chili oil on the plate. Uh, just absolutely dynamite. Uh, next category is um, what we're calling the raw and the uncooked, and that is crudité. So you may say, wow, crudité, now we're getting into like retro 1980s. Well, to quote the old uh, famous chef Jean uh, Toigreau, uh, there is nothing new under the sun, and all the things that are old become new again. Um, I would say one of the differences today, there's a couple of differences. Number one, back in the 80s, everybody was calling it crudites. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the, uh, back then, I mean, it was really just kind of just raw vegetables with some sort of dip. There wasn't a lot of creativity going into it. Today, we are just seeing these dropped it, gorgeous uh, plate presentations and arrangements, uh, a much wider variety of vegetables being used um, uh, on these crudité plates and bowls. And then once again, what is old becomes new again. Uh, green goddess dressing uh, has just become this uh, wonderful retro dip that uh, chefs are using for these different uh, crudité dishes. So uh, this first one, and I apologize because I, t I very stupidly took this picture from up above, uh, so uh, it didn't really convey properly what's happening with this crudité bowl because it's a nice wooden bowl and the presentation stood up about that high with the different lettuce leaves that were coming up across the top. Now this is actually a crudité salad that is being served at uh, Dirty French, uh, Rich Teresi's restaurant uh, right here on the Lower East Side. And so you just have a wonderful variety of uh, shaved vegetables that are tossed in a creamy fien herb vinaigrette. Um, so this is kind of a cross between um, a crudité and uh, a salad. But now here we have a uh, vegetable crudité dish. Once again, a very lovely presentation. Uh, this is at Restaurant Resto, um, and this is uh, uh, Chef Corin Greveson, who was a uh, trailblazing chef in Chicago at Restaurant Avec, which was really Chicago's first sharing plates and first communal seating uh, restaurant. Well, she has come to New York. She is now the executive chef at, uh, at Resto, and so this is her crudité pl uh, uh, plate. Wonderful variety of different vegetables, um, uh, some uh, you know small radishes, baby carrots, um, and then um, you can't really tell uh, on the plate because it's so pale, but it's actually a, um, a, a green goddess hummus uh, that she's serving as the uh, garnish on that plate. You know, here's another great example. I mean, this is, to me, such just a lovely uh, plate presentation uh, of crudité, once again here at Cafe Clover in um, uh, uh, the city right here. And uh, they, this is called the Market Crudité uh, with three different dipping sauces. Uh, one is a sesame ranch. Then in the center is um, a tuna tonato. Uh, so a, a kind of a, a, a mayonnaise-based uh, tuna sauce. Uh, and then, of course, our green goddess dressing uh, over on the right. Uh, just a, another wonderful presentation of crudité. This is from uh, Biff House, uh, a new restaurant in the uh, Bucktown neighborhood of Chicago. Uh, and you can see how all of these wonderful, vibrant, fresh, fresh vegetables can be uh, arranged in absolutely uh, beautiful ways. And I'll just give you one guess what kind of uh, dipping sauce that they have there in that bowl of ice. Yes, that is a green goddess dressing. Um, now, this is another crudité salad. This is at the uh, uh, Haywood Tavern in uh, Chicago. And um, this is not a green goddess dressing. This is actually a, a root vegetable vinaigrette that the chef is using. But he's taking all sorts of vegetables, tossing them in that root uh, vegetable uh, vinaigrette, and then actually arranging the crudité um, on the plate, completely dressed 
um, absolutely wonderful and delicious. But the uh, kind of the granddaddy of uh, crudité presentations uh, is this one at uh, Restaurant Santina. Um, and this is from the um, uh, major food group folks, which is uh, Rich Teresi and uh, Mario Carbone. Uh, this is kind of a uh, mm, Mediterranean restaurant that has some, some Asian inflections in it. Uh, and they call this their um, a Jardinera uh, crudité. Now the only problem with this picture is you can't see it to scale. Uh, this is actually a $25 bowl of crudité that is meant to be shared by the entire table and it is about, the bowl is about that big. This is a absolutely huge presentation with uh, assorted radishes and carrots and cucumber, um, slices of different uh, colored turnips, uh, bitter greens, and then all of those different uh, herb fronds, uh, and then served with a very nice trio of uh, dipping sauces um, from left to right, uh, a, a piquillo pepper uh, romanesco, an almond aioli, um, and a salsa verde. Uh, so once again, what is old becomes new again, but chefs are continually taking uh, these concepts and giving them new spins. Uh, now we saw a couple of toasts on the uh, the fruit side, and I know that toasts have been very big on menus for, for the past several years. I don't really get into the been there, done that type of thing. Um, uh, I mean, and a lot of people have, it, for example, an, uh, that sort of attitude toward kale. There are so many wonderful things still happening with kale on menus. I mean, if you say, well, no, I've seen kale on menus, so now I'm done with it. To me, that's a very dangerous thing because it really kind of uh, uh, inhibits creativity. And uh, matter of fact, in the toast here, we'll see. Uh, a kale-based toast that is uh, absolutely astoundingly delicious. Um, and of course, probably the most popular toast is avocado toast. Uh, very, very mainstream, but I don't care. I mean, there's a, a holiday craft mayonnaise commercial where they're making avocado toast in the kitchen and spreading on some of the craft mayonnaise. But uh, I'll tell you what, uh, it would be very hard to make one this delicious at home. Once again, this is from that butcher shop restaurant, Public and Quality Meats in Chicago, uh, where they're doing an avocado toast tossed with, or, or topped with just absolutely perfect soft scrambled eggs, uh, a little bit of feta cheese, um, and then squash. Uh, just little cubes of uh, pickled squash. So once again, flavor layering and complexity that um, you know takes these vegetables um, and completely elevates them beyond uh, what is expected. Um, here's another avocado toast. We really like this one um, at the Canela Breakfast Club. Uh, and here they're taking an avocado mash, they're putting it on the toast and then topping it with uh, some crispy fried garbanzo beans and uh, then a very, very generous drizzle of um, uh, sriracha. Uh, this is a um, roasted beet toast from a, actually a, a nose-to-tail restaurant in, uh, restu uh, in Chicago called Son of a Butcher, uh, where the, uh, the chef is taking uh, uh, Kyoja beets, uh, roasting them and slicing them, and then putting them on a piece of toast with caramelized onion uh, and ricotta cheese that he takes a torch to. So he's torching the ricotta and then putting those wonderful roasted beets on top for an absolutely dynamite toast. Uh, this is that kale toast I was talking about. This is from 50 Paces, uh, Chef Marco Canora right here in, uh, uh, um, on the, uh, in the East Village, uh, where he's taking kale and he's uh, braising it in um, uh, a tomato ragu uh, and then spreading some uh, ricotta cheese on the toast uh, and then putting on that wonderful uh, braised kale and some uh, uh, chopped walnuts. Uh, yet another toast, dynamite toast from uh, 50 Paces. Uh, this is a tomato confit uh, that's topped with basil and what I call a fudgy egg. Uh, we're seeing more and more of these and it makes a wonderful vegetable garnish. It also makes a nice garnish for steak tartare as well, but uh, what the chefs do is actually take the egg yolk and they put it in olive oil uh, and then they uh, uh, put those uh, egg yolks in the olive oil in an oven uh, at 150 for about an hour and what it does is it, 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 it makes the egg yolk just very, very thick and fudgy. So if that were just a regular egg yolk and you broke it, it would just run all over the place. Whereas this is almost the texture of peanut butter. Um, uh, once again, one of those cooking techniques that really help to enhance the, uh, enhance the dish. Now, Avant Garden um, is a new vegetarian restaurant in, uh, I'm sorry, it is a vegan restaurant uh, in New York, but we had read such uh, glowing reviews, we wanted to go in and, and see what they were doing. And I can tell you, um, once again, if you're going to have a successful commercial full-service restaurant and go straight vegan, uh, you're going to have to make sure that the, vet, that the uh, dishes are so flavorful that no one is missing the meat. And these people uh, really uh, hit the spot. Uh, one of the uh, anchors of 
of their menu is just a wide variety of different toasts. And uh, I mean, if you t once again, I, I don't think that you could take uh, meat and make such a wonderful looking dish um, as this toast that is uh, based on a smoked eggplant puree flavored with Calabrian chili, um, and then little bits of celery and Castro Vetrano olives uh, and topped with pickled shallots. Just a, an astoundingly delicious toast. And then likewise, I mean, this is just so beautiful. This is probably the most beautiful toast that we had seen uh, in our most recent tour, based on a carrot spread uh, that is flavored with the uh, North African uh, condiment, uh, chili condiment harissa, uh, and then uh, little uh, uh, small dices of apple, uh, dollops of whipped tofu, and uh, little sprigs of tarragon. Uh, just absolutely dynamite. Uh, now here, actually, this is a sandwich rather than a toast, but we just love this so much. And this is just from a little breakfast shop in Brooklyn called Early. Uh, this is definitely something that you could take and you could upscale it if you would like, but they call this their zappy sandwich. And uh, it's basically a bag, toasted baguette that's layered with caramelized onions uh, and then garlic mushrooms, uh, fontina cheese, the absolute perfect amount of truffle oil so that you do, I mean, just you get that nice little aroma as opposed to a dead skunk in the road because they put a few two extra drops on there. Um, melted Fontina cheese chives um, on this toasted baguette, absolutely dynamite. And then yet another really downscale sandwich shop called Drive-In Sandwiches in uh, Williamsburg in Brooklyn uh, do this thing they call the Three Amigos. Now, this technically is not really a toast because it's actually topped on top with toast. Um, but what they're doing here is taking uh, cherry tomatoes and they're uh, uh, oven roasting those um, and then uh, layering Fontina cheese, the roasted uh, cherry tomatoes, and then those are not grill marks on the toast on the top that's actually a balsamic glaze that they drizzle on. Uh, it certainly could be done very nicely open-faced, uh, but I wanted to show that in the toast category uh, because it was just, just absolutely so delicious. And then our uh, closing category I am calling the orange-headed stepchild. Uh, once again, I will tell you that I do not get into the bend there, done that thing. Um, for the, for the past, I don't know, half a dozen years, kale and Brussels sprouts have uh, been the darlings on menus. Uh, if I see uh, a wonderful Brussels sprout or kale dish on a menu, I am perfectly happy. I don't look at it and say, oh, geez, they're still doing Brussels sprouts, something like that. Um, in our uh, 2015 research in January and February, we really found that carrots and cauliflower um, had risen to the top as far as kind of the new darlings on menus. Uh, and that is being followed by what I am calling the orange-headed stepchild, and that is squash. Uh, which is being used in increase, increasingly creative ways. But um, I did want to just uh, bounce a couple of carrot and cauliflower dishes off of you to kind of, because I mean, once again, these dishes are still absolutely red hot. So um, uh, this is the first dish. This is from restaurant uh, Cadet Chef Chris Tomanaga in Los Angeles. Pardon me. This dish tells you everything that you need to know about carrots on uh, uh, casual and casual upscale commercial menus today. I can truly say, I, I, I really believe we have seen the last peeled carrot in commercial food service. There, why in the world would you peel it? Uh, dining consumers love the fact that you know, now these carrots are being served, you know, un, just scrubbed and then roasted or, or grilled. Um, here Chef Tomanaga takes the whole carrots and he puts them in embers to char them a little bit and then he finishes them uh, in the wood burning oven. Uh, but the stems are left on. If there's any kind of hairy, gnarly, knobby stuff, all the better. I mean, it really speaks to the freshness of the uh, the carrots uh, to the dining consumer. But then, of course, you have to layer in those flavors. Um, uh, with this particular dish, once again, Chef Tomanaga uh, uh, puts the carrots in the uh, embers, then oven roasts them, and then tops them uh, with a, a, a wonderful preserved lemon vinaigrette and some uh, freshly shaved uh, Pecorino Romano. Uh, but then also uh, cauliflower. I wanted to show this uh, dish. This was not the most delicious cauliflower dish we tasted in our research in January and February, but it was really the most distinctive because what Jesse Schenker at the Gander here in New York was doing, uh, he has a horizontal rotisserie in his kitchen completely devoted to rotisserie roasting uh, cauliflower. So every night, slowly turning on this rotisserie or these vegetables. Uh, there's another restaurant here in New York called Narcissa. They have a vertical uh, rotisserie in their open kitchen completely devoted devoted to roasting beets. And I'll tell you, I mean, you really want to give vegetables some unbelievable depth of flavor. Do them on a rotisserie. Um, and so here, uh, Chef Schenker is taking that rotisserie cauliflower. I did cut into that so you could, it's not, doesn't look like just like a brown blob. You can actually see that that's cauliflower. Uh, and, he's to and he's topping it with a fairly traditional kind of a Polonaise type butter or olive oil breadcrumb. 
Uh, but once again, um, he's adding um, some chopped of uh, crispy fried capers um, and uh, uh, avocado, uh, avocado, uh, anchovy paste uh, to this butter breadcrumb to once again uh, kick up that umami, uh, no longer a meatless dish. Uh, and then talk about not meatless. This was such an astounding hit of cauliflower um, at restaurant Aldo Somme. Uh, wine bar uh, right here in New York, Chef uh, Eric Fricker. Uh, what this is, is a head of cauliflower that they poach in chicken stock, uh, and that basically is the prep. They poach it in chicken stock, they cool it. When they get an order uh, in the kitchen, they throw it in the oven, and then they uh, allow that to get nicely charred and, and, and heated in the oven. Uh, but then they take chicken skin, which they have um, very dutifully uh, uh, roasted, flash frozen, and powdered. Uh, and then they just hit this thing with a blizzard of uh, powdered chicken skin. Uh, and so you have this wonderful, uh, really chicken-based umami that runs through the entire uh, head of cauliflower. And it may seem ridiculous, uh, at the idea that you could actually sit down and eat an entire head of cauliflower on its own, but I this was just absolutely so delicious. Uh, were this not restaurant six of eight that particular day, I think I could have knocked out that cauliflower myself. But once again, we are talking about the orange-headed stepchild, uh, squash. Uh, this is the type of thing that we are seeing with uh, squash today. This first one is from restaurant San uh, Santina. Uh, I mean, take a look at that. That's um, uh, um, delicata squash. Uh, that they're serving as a carpaccio, um, and, and I talked extensively. I was not able to get the uh, chef de cuisine out into the uh, dining room, but I talked extensively with the, uh, the waiter about this particular dish, and he did confirm that they actually take the delicata squash, they peel it, and then they shave it very thinly on a Japanese mandolin, uh, so it is raw, but then they take and they put this whole arrangement um, underneath a salamander, and they allow this with uh, just a little bit of sugar and some olive oil, they allow this to caramelize, and it actually makes the, the squash just a little bit tender. Uh, and then they top it with uh, dollops of a spiced labne, the, the uh, Greek yogurt cheese, uh, some fresh herb, and, uh, and toasted pumpkin seeds. Um, that, to me, is just an absolutely astounding dish. Um, this is also from Publican uh, Quality... Or, uh, actually, this is from the Publican. This is the full-service adjunct to pu uh, Publican Quality Meats in Chicago, uh, where Chef Cosmo Goss uh, has done a wonderful, one of the first true vegetable-centric offerings uh, in Chicago. And this, interestingly, is called an avocado salad. And if you look at the very corner uh, of the plate, you can see a little piece of avocado sticking out. But this whole thing is anchored by this uh, 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 thinly sliced roasted butternut squash, uh, and then garnished with grapes, sprinkled with a, ooh, pardon me, with a wonderful voodoo spice and uh, toasted sunflower flower seeds. Um, likewise, he takes delicata squash, which you see as the base of this shaved uh, Brussels sprout dish, uh, and makes what he calls a uh, delicata squash whipped ricotta. Uh, so he's roasting that squash, and then he's whipping it with ricotta cheese and using that as the uh, uh, base of the plate for this uh, uh, wonderful shaved Brussels sprouts uh, flavored with charred onions, uh, just a little bit of um, habanero pepper, and uh, sliced pear. Um, yet another dish where um, a chef is shaving uh, delicata squash, and here it is being used as a garnish on steak tartare. Uh, this is from Untitled, where Michael Anthony is taking his beef tartare uh, and then shaving that delicata squash, making a wonderful garnish, uh, uh, unique and delicious uh, for this beef tartare, uh, and then garnishing the dish with some uh, finely chopped um, roasted chestnuts. Uh, of course, you can take uh, squash and use it in a variety of ways for rice um, uh, and grain dishes. This is the seasonal risotto uh, from La Picora Bianca, uh, where they're taking roasted butternut squash and they're ma making just a wonderful stock um, uh, with the butternut squash and using that to, uh, to create this risotto. Once again, not a vegetarian dish. It's garnished with uh, bits of crispy roasted speck and uh, deep fried sage leaves. Um, here also, uh, a great example of vegetable-centric uh, using squash uh, from the uh, Haywood Tavern in Chicago. This is a butternut squash and bacon rillette. Uh, of course, rillette classically is some sort of meat that is slowly cooked in fat and then shredded. Um, here the chef, Rodney Stanton, um, is taking butternut squash, uh, bacon, bacon fat, and olive oil and slowly cooking it and then shredding the squash uh, and turning it into a vegetable-based rillette. Absolutely dynamite. Uh, likewise, in Chicago, Ampersand Wine Bar, uh, they're taking delicata squash, garnishing it with uh, uh, little dollops of uh, fresh ricotta cheese, but at the top of the plate um, is a nice dollop of andouille, which is that cr uh, uh, creamy Italian salami spread. 
And the whole idea is that you take a piece of the squash, you take a little of the andouille, you spread it on, uh, and that provides that, that once again, that meat-based uh, umami kick for the squash. Uh, and this is a, here's a wonderful vegetable casserole. This is also, once again, this is a, this is a, a nose-to-tail restaurant, uh, son of a butcher in uh, Chicago. Uh, here, Eldofo Garcia is doing uh, what he calls his veggie casserole, um, using a half of a butternut squash, or buttercup squash, uh, that is roasted and then filled with a, um, uh, uh, just like a, a wonderful vegetable stew with buttercup squash and farro, uh, braised leek, and uh, feta cheese. And then finally, our, uh, our last plate presentation. This is from Restaurant Bara, uh, kind of a, a Japanese mashup restaurant um, uh, right here in Soho uh, in New York where uh, Ian Alvarez does what he calls his market winter squash. And the reason I wanted to end with this is because we see a lot of acorn, delicata, uh, buttercup squash. Uh, the, the squash that he was using here is a golden nugget, you know, which, well, I mean, you're probably all very familiar with it. I really wasn't. You know, it looks, it has a kind of a pumpkin like look to it. Uh, just an absolute absolutely delicious flavor, the way that this was roasted and uh, then garnished once again, very interestingly, with a smoked um, uh, farmer's cheese uh, and then drizzled with some brown butter and uh, chopped hazelnuts. So um, I haven't had a chance yet to go to the market and pick up some uh, a golden nugget squash, but it is definitely something I'm doing. So once again, I mean, you know, it's very easy to stand up here and say, you know, that, that um, you know, we should promote chefs. Uh, you know, adopting a, a vegetable-centric mindset, you know, wh I mean, what does that mean? You know, once again, wh what we're talking about are, are chefs that are uh, taking fresh produce and they're treating it with that same high regard uh, as they formerly had reserved for meats, uh, you know, and fish and poultry. And as a chef, uh, I mean, myself, generally when I'm ID eating new dishes, you just kind of naturally think, well, okay, what are we going to put into the center of the plate? Is it going to be that, that beef or pork or chicken, whatever? Uh, what these chefs are doing now when they're doing their ideation, they are treating fresh produce as an equal opportunity ingredient uh, in the center of the plate. And uh, uh, once again, I mean, we have a handful of restaurants around, across the country that have really embraced this. Uh, we have seen what, uh, you know, how, what consumer reaction is. So I, I think that we have this unbelievable opportunity uh, in front of us. Uh, and of course, it involves uh, using the more aggressive cooking techniques to help to build the flavor into the vegetable dishes. That 97% of omnivorous, omnivorous diners are going to order more of these vegetable-based dishes if they have that type of flavor. And to, in my mind, the great strategies of using um, a very, very very flavorful uh, uh, meat, sausages, protein elements um, as uh, the flavor enhancers on the plate along with this relatively new technique of cooking vegetables and meat broths um, are really moving things along. Um, so, you know, personally, I believe that the industry, uh, you know, should really embrace, uh, uh, promote, and advocate uh, this type of cooking. Um, I think that, that as more chefs across the country, as this trend moves to the interior, you know, as they see what is happening with this, you know, more chefs are going to pick up on this because you know, I, I believe that chefs are, you know, it's kind of like a shark, they got to swim. It's, it's kind of the same creative thing with chefs. Once they latch onto this idea of pulling vegetables and to a lesser degree fruit into the center of the plate, there's going to be more and more creativity happening here and uh, this golden age of produce is going to, to move along. So uh, there is no reason to feel any more, uh, particularly in mainstream food service, that, that vegetables are the uh, support act. And um, you know, I feel that baby boomers uh, gravitate toward these type of dishes. Uh, but boy, I'll tell you, when you get to the Millennials and Gen Z, I mean, they're going to increasingly uh, uh, embrace this type of dining. So dining consumers are ready for this. All we have to do is just get these sort of dishes into their mouths, and uh, they're going to be ready. So once again, famous last words. I know I ran over a little bit, and I apologize about that. But uh, once again, the good news is you were the very first to see these new dishes uh, from our most recent research. So I just want to thank everybody so much. Uh, we went through a lot of material in a short time. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me uh, this year at the New York Produce Conference. Thank you.